Welcome to the study of God's Word with pastor and author Ed Taylor, recorded live from Calvary Chapel in Aurora, Colorado. To learn more about the many resources available through Abounding Grace Media, visit us online at calvaryaurora.org or download our free app on all platforms. And now, here's Pastor Ed to take us into our study. Amen. Would you open your Bibles to John chapter 15? In a Bible study that I've entitled Day by Day and Moment by Moment in Jesus. And it's here in John chapter 15 that we're introduced to that beautiful picture of the vine and the vine dresser. Notice with me in verse 1. Jesus says, I am the true vine and my father is the vine dresser. Every branch in me that does not bear fruit, he takes away. And every branch that bears fruit, he prunes that it may bear more fruit. You are already clean because of the word which I've spoken to you. And notice in verse 4, you might want to circle this phrase if you haven't already. Abide in me and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself unless it abides in the vine, neither can you unless you abide in me. I am the vine and you are the branches. He who abides in me and I in him bears much fruit For without me, you can do nothing. So we have the vine and we have the vine dresser. We have branches. And he's bringing the disciples and bringing us back to what's very important in our relationship with him. It's not a religious expression. It is not our religious heritage. It's not the activities that we have outwardly. What's important for us is to learn to abide in relationship. Relationship, it's a beautiful picture because we all have relationships, human, on the human level. And we know that relationships grow over time and they grow with time and testing. And so it's not a formality. I mean, if following Jesus was just a bunch of outward activities, then many Christians would be very good ones. But it's not about the outward. It's about the inward. And here in the first few verses, we learn just how well taken care of we are by the vine dresser. That's the emphasis. The emphasis is upon those that we care for, those that we're connected. This idea of a well-watered garden. To be a well-watered garden is great because I know that there are many that love to garden among us and as the weather and the seasons are changing, it's going to be gardening time again and You want to grow things, and it's wonderful the care and concern that you have, all the studying that you do with just the right soil and the right light, and on and on it goes. Well, imagine the human care for for plants and for roses and such. How much more the Father cares for you? How much he takes care of you? And like the nation of Israel, God is still today looking for fruit among his church. Now, the good news about God looking for fruit is that fruit occurs naturally. It occurs through a relationship. Now, most of us don't think about it all that much. Many of us don't really care all that much. But when you see fruit or you see a flower, remember that happens through relationship. You know, there's no need for a tree to work hard to try to produce fruit. There's no groaning going on as you're driving by or trees are making faces and just really stressing out because they know their responsibility is to produce fruit. That's not how it works. It's the right area with the right root system, with the right nutrients, with the right farmer comes fruit naturally. Now, if you're taking notes, let me lay a few things out for you of the Bible describes as fruit. And you say, Ed, why are you starting here in a message about moving forward from our past? Well, listen, you are in your best place as a believer as you abide in Christ and produce fruit. Think of it this way. The production of fruit in your life and mine from God's presence in our lives is the natural outcome of the abiding life. So that when there's not fruit from your life, that tells me you're not abiding. And when you're not abiding, the Bible would call that being in your flesh or relying upon your own resources, or your own smarts, or your own works, which all are empty. Consider some of the things that the Bible speaks of as fruit. Number one, winning souls is spoken of as fruit in Romans chapter 1, verse 13. Holiness 
is spoken of as fruit in Romans chapter 6, verse 22. Giving financially, Romans chapter 15, verse 28. Number four, helping others practically, Colossians chapter 1, verse 6. Number five, when you give praise to God, that's a fruit, Hebrews chapter 13, verse 15. Number six, love. Remember in Galatians chapter 5, verse 22, it gives us a list of the fruit of the Spirit, which many believe is just manifestation of one fruit of the Spirit, love. There is a list there, love, joy, peace, patience, kindness, goodness, gentleness, self-control, against such there is no law. Many people look at that list and say everything after love is a manifestation of the fruit of love. I like that. I think it can go both ways. A key for the Christian in bearing fruit is given in this section, and it's the word abide. In this section before us, all the way through verse 10, the word abide is mentioned some 15 times, and it's very important for your life and mine. Why is abiding so important? Well, notice in verse 5, without me, you can do nothing. Now, remember, I've mentioned to you that in my Bible, I've used different color highlighters to remind me at a quick glance what I'm looking at. And so I have yellow in my Bible, and that rep represents just general highlights of what the Lord gave me. And, you know, in my first Bible, I was so excited about highlighting that I pretty much highlighted every single word. But that defeats the purpose of highlighting. And so in this one, I was a little, more, a little bit more careful in highlighting, even using different colors. And so yellow is general. And then I use the, the color orange. And instead of highlighting everything as it goes through the page, I just highlighted the, the verse number. And orange reminds me of any of the passages that speak of the deity of, the Holy, or deity of Jesus Christ. Because the deity of Jesus Christ is important uh, to, to dealing with most cults. Because everybody has it wrong with Jesus. So just look what the Bible has to say. But you know, it's hard to find those verses sometimes. But as I look here, I can see orange, 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 orange right away. It shows me that those are passages that are going to speak to me about the deity of Jesus Christ. Then I use the color pink. Again, just the numbers of the verses. And I use the color pink to remind me of the passages that speak of the Holy Spirit. Because the Holy Spirit, the second person, or the third person of the Trinity, is the most un misunderstood person of the Godhead. And people get it wrong with the power and the presence and the person and the work of the Holy Spirit. But then I use green. And green I'll highlight. And green reminds me personally of go. And anytime I see a green verse, it reminds me it's a, it's a passage of Scripture that's going to help me serve Jesus better. It's going to put things into perspective for me. And at the end of verse 5, I share all that with you to say at the end of verse 5, the phrase, for without me, you can do nothing, is green in my Bible. It's very important for me to realize as I walk with Jesus Christ, as I serve Jesus Christ, as I exercise the gifts of pastor, teacher, as I have the privilege of leading and serving, that I must remember that without Jesus I can do nothing, which gives me a couple of insights. Number one, I can do a lot of things without Jesus. I can, do, I can produce a lot of things without Jesus. I can do a lot of religious activities without Jesus. I can find myself very active and busy, even doing things in Jesus' name without Jesus. But I'm telling you this, without Jesus, I can do nothing of eternal value, anything that's going to last anything that reflects his love and his character. And what I learn in verse 5 is that Jesus can take a person that has no fruit to much fruit by his indwelling presence. No fruit to much fruit. And the key is abiding. The difference between walking in the flesh and walking in the spirit. The difference between living in the new covenant and the old covenant is abiding. You see, Jesus has invaded our lives. And notice down in verse 16, it says, you did not choose me, but I chose you and appointed you that you should go and bear fruit and that your fruit should remain, that whatever you ask the Father in my name, he might give you. And there's a lot of talk today about us choosing Jesus and about our choice to follow and our response to the gospel. And, and I understand in one sense that kind of language. But the reality is, is that Jesus chose you, that he sought you out, that he wanted to enter into a relationship with you, that he came for you. 
to take over so that we might become more and more like him. And if you really want to start growing and bearing much fruit, then you're going to watch Jesus rearrange things in your life. The life of the disciple, the follower of Jesus, is a life rearranged. It's a life rearranged. Jesus, he accepts us as we are. (laughs) He loves us as we are. But he doesn't let us stay that way. The whole process of your life in relationship with Jesus is his work of conforming you into his image. I was just meditating on this today, hearing some things with the kids and hearing some other testimonies of really difficult issues that are in front of me right now. And I was thinking of this verse in Romans chapter 12 where it speaks of not being conformed to this world. And, and the Phillips translation translates that verse, don't allow the world to press you into its mold. And I like that picture because whatever gets pressed into a mold becomes that form. And if you haven't recognized it lately or haven't acknowledged it lately, the world system that we live in has a form. It it has an ideal. It's shifting and it's changing, but the root of the form of this world is godlessness. It is a world without God, without accountability. It's a world where very much like in the book of Judges, everyone does that which is right in their own eyes, regardless the pain or the sorrow that sin brings. There's a general emptiness in this world in those that are separated from Jesus Christ that they're spending entire, their entire lives trying to fill it. And yet from the greatest of what the world considers the greatest, the ones with the most amount of money, the ones that have the most notoriety, the ones that have the most attention tend to be some of the most miserable. And just reading again, it seems as if on the news feed that I have, I I read every day there's a story of another celebrity going into rehab and another celebrity checking in for mental health care. And another celebrity of looking at the situation in their life and just unable to cope. Well, let me say, friends, that that's not just a world thing. I find that many of us as believers have a difficulty coping with the difficulties of life. We have a challenge. The challenge of life's come and it rises up a choice. And instead of abiding in Christ, the place of perfect peace, many believers are following the way of the world and choosing coping mechanisms that really are what the Bible would refer to as idolatry. Things that would lead us to a place of temporary peace, but give no permanent eternal help. And I say that one of the greatest solutions to the problems in our lives is learning this simple phrase, to learn to live moment by moment in dependence upon Jesus Christ. Moment by moment. Jesus would share that with us when he talked to us about not worrying. And he spoke to us in the book of Matthew. He taught us about having, praying and asking God for what? Our daily bread. But when you think about that, church, and I have to include myself when we think about that, when's the last time that daily bread was of a great concern to you? On occasion, there are. On occasion, in a, in a world of great excess, there are those that struggle and wrestle. But in a general sense, in our culture, in our day and age, I haven't met too many people within the body of Christ that really wrestle with daily bread. Now, there are financial struggles. I'm not speaking toward that. And there are difficulties with pr- paying the rent. As I met a brother not too long ago, he was days away from, he needed rent. It was $1,000. He came up to me and asked me for prayer. He was, he, his face was of great concern. And he had made some decisions and he had an emergency. And so he used the rent money to go in this direction. And, and so he looks at me and I, I mean, I just need rent. And I said, well, we need to pray. We need to pray. And so I laid hands on him. We prayed together. And, and uh, there was a, a, a peace. But then you know how peace just gets ripped off. And then you're, you're like, okay, amen. I need 1000 bucks. You know, it didn't show up. And yet, he left here with hope. Because we, we, we both sought God for a thousand bucks. Well, wouldn't you know it, the day before the rent was due, the thousand bucks showed up. He got, his rent, he got his tax refund, and it's a testimony to God. 
may not be daily bread. It may be a rent payment, a mortgage payment. But Jesus taught us from the very beginning that it's a moment-by-moment dependent life. It's a moment-by-moment dependent life. And if we can learn how to reduce our lives down to a moment-by-moment dependence, a moment-by-moment trust, a moment-by-moment release, learning to truly obey when it says to cast our cares upon him because he cares for us, we'll see great fruit. Now, the first time that abide is mentioned here is in verse 4. If you've circled it, you can write next to it the word meno, M-E-N-O is the Greek word. And it simply means to remain, to dwell, to stay put. It speaks of an intimacy, a closeness, a permanent attachment. Let me read to you from the message, paraphrase. I like how they put it. John chapter 15, verse 4. It says, live in me. Make your home in me just as I do in you in the same way that a branch can't bear grapes by itself, but only by being joined to the vine. You can't bear fruit unless you're joined with me. I I like that phrase. Make your home in me. Make your home in me. That's a great picture because when we leave here in a few moments, we're all going to go home. We're going to go to our home, our address, The room that we rent, the apartment, the condo, the house, the duplex, the triplex. It's going to be our address. We're we're not going to go close to our home. We're not going to try to hit it close by just going to our street and walking into any house that we decide to park in. We have developed a habit, and it's a good habit. You're going to go home, your home, the place that God has given you to dwell, the place that is your refuge. The place that is where you rest and you sleep and you eat and you enjoy family and friends. It's your home. Make your home in him. Make it in him. In the New Living Translation, it translates verse 5. Yes, I'm the vine and you're the branches. Those who remain in me and I in them will produce much fruit. For apart from me, you can do nothing. So here's the key. You know, dealing with our past, because we all have them, as we've seen in earlier studies, and dealing with the issues that inflame our emotions, dealing with the great hurt and pain that we endure in a life filled with sin, having to handle the consequences of our own bad decisions, and everything that's included in living life. The way to deal with our past is to remain in Christ. Because the alternative is to the idea of running around carelessly, aimlessly. Like we used to, the Bible says in Ephesians, we wandered aimlessly before we were saved. There was really no purpose, no goal. We weren't shooting at anything. We were living life any way that we wanted, and whatever a day might bring, that's what we would handle. And if we defined it in such and such a way and we hit our own definition, we felt sort of good. But see, we only find strength and fruit from remaining, staying put, not running away from the presence of Jesus Christ. So how do you abide? I think that's a good question. What actually happens when you and I abide? It's not some esoteric spiritual teaching where, you know, abiding just sitting on your couch and not moving. But where is it spiritually? How does abiding take place in our lives? Well, abiding begins with a confession of faith. A confession of faith. It is the confession that you trust Jesus Christ. It is a confession of your born-again experience. It's a confession of his sufficiency in your life. It could be a variety of different things. It's where you and I know the word of God and we begin to speak it forth into our lives. Where, for example, you have a care today. Well, you just confess the scripture, casting my cares upon God. I'm going to cast my cares upon you today. That's a statement of abiding. I'm not going to run to the bottle. I'm not going to get worked up by it. I'm not going to get mad about it. And you can rehearse the whole thing before the Lord just in your prayer time. But I'm going to cast my care upon you today, God, because that's what you said to do. And it begins with a confession, a statement of agreement with God's word. Because God's word is true whether you confess and agree to it or not. It stands true. 
And so to activate it in our lives and to enjoy it in our lives, we confess. So Lord, I'm going to cast this care upon you today. And then secondly, abiding is followed up by a steady obedience, a steady choice, right? Jesus said in John 14 earlier in verse 15, if you love me, keep my commandments. If you love me, and who doesn't say, I mean, if Jesus came and he was here today and you said, I got a quick question for you. I'm just passing through Aurora. I got a quick question. Do you love me? What would you say? Nothing, huh? Well, Lord, I'm going to pray for our church. (laughs) What would you say? Do you love me, Jesus says? Yes, "Yes, of course. And you know what Jesus would say? Keep my commandments. My commandments are not burdensome. My yoke is easy. My burden is light. Keep my commandments. That's the fruit of abiding, obedience. You see, think about it. As you're saying, Father, I've come to you in prayer, you're in a place of obedience. As you start speaking forth the word of something that's ministering to you, I'm going to cast my care. You're in obedience. Your mind is focused. Your lips are following. And your actions will follow. You know, it starts with a confession. And it is followed up through obedience. The how-to of abiding begins not with a work. It's not a work that gets you there, but with an attitude. It's an attitude. An attitude to be maintained, a belief. You said, well, what do you mean, Ed? Well, when you leave here today and you go home and you go to your house and your address and your lock in the door or your garage door opening, you go there, and I know this is not super big and super new to you, but you've got to understand that you live this way already. When you go home, you believe that's your home. You actually head in that direction. You don't talk to Siri and say, "Uh, I I forgot where I live. Can you just take me home? No, you're, you're confident. You know where you live. And in order to enjoy, I mean, we don't even do this out loud. It's so common to us. We don't even speak out loud. You don't jump in and you you know, right to your car, sit down in your car. I'm going to go home. I live at 123 Main Street, and I'm going to get there in 15 minutes. You don't even do that. But you, you have done it so many times that it's very natural for you. And your attitude is, when you go home, is you're going to go home. To whose home? Your home. And when it comes to our relationship with Jesus Christ, it's the same. You know, you could even say that, when I'm, when I'm stirring in my mind and I can't control my thoughts and my feelings overwhelm me, you could put it this way. I'm going to go home. I'm going to go home spiritually. I'm overwhelmed by my thoughts, Lord. And I'm coming home. And it begins with an attitude of going home. And it's followed with an attitude of dependence, which requires what? Humility on our part. That in reality, I'm unable to produce any fruit from my life on my own. You know, sometimes we'll be in such a hurry. He goes, oh, I just got to gather my thoughts. You're unable to gather your thoughts spiritually without the power of the Holy Spirit. It starts with Jesus. It does, Jesus doesn't show up in the middle. It starts with him. And that even if you were able to gather your thoughts for a few moments, apart from Christ... Those thoughts are going to be back bigger and harder constantly. The barrage of living in this world. How does that relate to the past? Well, the past is a great accuser. The past, especially those things that we regret, those things that we wish would have never happened, those situations where you know as well as I do, if you had a chance to do it over, you would have avoided it altogether. And yet, nonetheless, you are who you are by the accumulation of all the activity of your past. And yet, the Bible says there is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ. And what's another way of describing being in Christ? Abiding. You see, the Bible is one message. It's a message getting us to Jesus Christ who took care of all of our sin. And took the wrath and punishment upon himself. 
so we would have a refuge. When the Bible speaks of God being our refuge, it speaks of abiding. When, when the Bible speaks of the name of the Lord as a strong tower, the righteous run into it and are saved, that's a speaking of abiding. When we turn that around as if I have to run, you know, you just change your mind. It starts with an attitude. You get your idea, well, you know, the name of the Lord is a strong tower, but the tower is way over there, and I have no energy to get way over there. But it's not about you and your works. It's a mindset. Because the Bible speaks of Jesus Christ dwelling in us. And so, number one, you, you have a, it starts with faith, a confession. Secondly, you know yourself, and you carry an attitude of dependence. And that, that's... One of the greatest barriers when we have failed is pride. Acknowledging that we have failed, receiving the forgiveness of God, and abiding. That attitude of dependence. The the person that is most disappointed in our failures is actually us. We're like so disappointed in ourselves. We kick ourselves Man, we say, I wish I would have never done that. Anybody ever confess that out of their mouths? Yes or no? Oh my goodness. I could show you things right now that I'm paying the price for that I did years ago. And believe me, I wish I didn't do them. I actually did it against counsel. I've shared it with you before, but you know, one of the things I I teach the men and women that serve around here is don't use email for difficult conversations. As a matter of fact, I keep getting less and less And you know, a sentence or two on an email is about enough for me these days. And even then, I can mess up a sentence or two. Any amen on that? So now it's just a word or a period, man. And you can call me and go, what was this all about? Let's talk about it. But we received a difficult email years ago, about six years ago. And I got it, and and I just couldn't believe my eyes. I just couldn't believe someone, I couldn't believe I received this email. I just, I'm like, what is this? This is, I can't believe this. I can't believe that they believe that what they wrote about me and my family. And so what did I do? Did I take that email before the Lord like King Hezekiah and say, God, what would you like me to do, my great defender with this email? Set up an altar in my house. I can climb the little mountain in my office and seek the Lord like Moses did. No. No. I sat down in my office, opened up my little laptop, and began to answer that email point by point. Ding! Now that's an old typewriter, but you know, <laughs> you know, and I'm writing it, I'm writing it, and and you know, it was a very difficult time right after the passing of my son. It was a very difficult time, tensions high in the house, and my my uh, old, my other son just came back from Bible college, and and uh, he walks by the office with the door open. He says, "Dad, don't do that. Don't write the email." You know, you're not supposed to use email like that. We should pray. No, 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 no. That was for you. That, that's, I'm the exception <laughs> or some dumb thing like that. And I was serious. I was serious. And Marie's over on the other side of the house in the kitchen. Don't write that email. And only the beautiful voice that I could hear. And I'm like, no. And I sent it to her. And I said, read it and proof it. And then after you proof it, then I'll send it. And, you know, I don't remember exactly how it all went, but she, nobody approved of that sending that email, including God. And I remember hitting the send button. And you can't take it back after that. And I remember how self-justified I was. I remember anticipating how that email, even if it was published in the newspaper, would vindicate my family and vindicate the situation. And it did none of those things. It only emboldened the enemy to stir up more strife and more difficulty that to this very day, that email is a part of some of the difficulties that that we face as a family. It's unbelievable. You see, we all have things that we regret. And the only way that that email can overwhelm me is not to explain it away, not even to share it as a testimony, although let me tell you why I'm sharing it. And it's perfectly okay uh, to get a laugh out of it because laughter in difficult times is actually very healthy. And I'm in no way offended by that at all. Because if I had the chance, I would have never sent it and I would have never shared that with you. But I'll tell you why I'm sharing it with you. I'm sharing it with you so you 
don't commit the same failure that I did. That instead, we've learned in previous studies, haven't we? You just take those stuff to Hez like Hezekiah did. You lay it before the Lord and let him take care of it. Just let him take care of it. As Pastor Chuck Smith taught us, you have two choices when it comes to defending yourself. Number one, you can defend yourself. You'll have the freedom to defend yourself. And God will allow you to defend yourself. But with what resources? An email? Some few choice words? An argument? You'll be limited by your own limited resources. Or by faith. And again, as you start to read through the scriptures, you will find that most of the activity that is spoken of in the scriptures, both Old and New Covenant, speaks of abiding and allowing God to do the work. Because the second choice is, as you allow God to be your defense, you are, you are allowing God and his righteousness and his perfect justice to take care of you as he did when you were first born again. And then you can live by faith, abiding. You're not relying upon your own crafty words. You're not relying upon your own ideas. Even with the best crafted emails, we only have limited knowledge. Have you noticed that? None of us have absolute knowledge about everything to know about everything, but God does. And as you and I learn to allow God to defend us, then it's no longer reliance upon our works. And that's where the fruit of life comes. It comes in the abiding life. You see, it begins with this attitude, a belief, a mindset. Secondly, you follow it by an attitude of dependence and humility. And then thirdly, you believe. You believe. Believing is not so much a work as it is rest. Belief is actually rest on the promises of God. Resting in him. Receiving patiently trusting, right? The fruit of the Spirit, abiding. The fruit of the Spirit is long-suffering, patience. Abiding involves, fourthly, re relaxing and not striving. The abiding life is not a feeling, but an awareness of God's presence in our lives. And then finally, abiding involves surrender, number five. A surrendered will. Because the alternative is when you and I choose not to abide, then we place ourselves in the position of God. Because we're simply not trusting him. And you see the habit of a moment-by-moment -moment declaration and dependence and surrender to God is very fruitful. The fruit that God is looking for in our lives is not something we can produce ourselves. So the fruit of being free from your past is not something you can produce yourself. It's not something you can convince yourself of. It's not something that you can run as fast as you can away from. The solution is to abide. This is where many of us get frustrated and we get upset because we're, at, we're so active and we're so working hard and we offer God our works and we measure that we did more today than we did yesterday. And we offer to God our works to be well-pleasing to the Lord. And for a time, it's okay. We're able to keep up. But the reality is, is that failure is just up ahead. And so what will we do when we fail, fail? We'll stumble. And all of a sudden, no longer are we abiding, but depending on our own works. When we perform, we feel good. For example, the temptation would be, for our church family, which is far larger than the folks that are here right now on a Wednesday night service. But here's a temptation. It's a very simple temptation. For those that are here on Wednesday night, you have the temptation of feeling better than those that didn't come. And just comparing yourself. Well, you know what? We made it there. We're all the slackers. On Who are they? What are they doing? Oh, what are they doing tonight? And, and before you know it, you're in a place of judgment, in a place of judging yourself better and judging others worse, which is not a place of abiding. The place of abiding is, man, it's so good to be in the house of the Lord. I want to be there as much as I can. And if I can't be there, then I'll be somewhere else. But wherever I am, I'll be abiding in Jesus Christ. I'll be abiding in the presence of the Lord and He in me. Because without me, Jesus said, you can do nothing. 
He says, notice, come back to verse 6. He says, if anyone does not abide in me, this is John 15, he's cast out as a branch and withered. They gather them and throw them into the fire and they're burned. However, in verse 7, if you abide in me, I love this, and my words abide in you, you'll ask whatever you desire and it shall be done for you. And by this my Father is glorified that you bear much fruit so you'll be my disciples. And as the Father loved me, I also loved you and abide in my love. If you keep my commandments, you will abide in my love just as I have kept my Father's commandments and abide in his love. Do you know the moment you, you were born again, you, you started abiding in Christ? It's the closest thing that I can think of of a pure abiding in Jesus Christ. When I was born again, I'll use my own example, I didn't know the Bible. I didn't know how to pray. I didn't know about different, I didn't know anything. I knew that God loved me, that he offered to forgive me of my sins through the finished work of Jesus Christ. I knew I needed to leave my sins. I mean, I had a very elementary view of God. I knew God was God and I wasn't. But like, I, I didn't know a lot. I didn't know where the books of the Bible were, any of that. I didn't even have, I did, when I was born again, we didn't even have a Bible in the house. And yet, the finished work of Jesus Christ descended upon me in that moment in a very pure way. So that, even if I didn't understand the word abide or know what the Greek word meno meant. And my pastor said, yeah, you know, now from now on, you're going to enjoy Jesus Christ the rest of your life. He lives in you and, I, and you live in him. You know my response? That's awesome. <laughs> this is crazy. I can't believe it. God is me and I'm in him. I wouldn't walk out going, what in the world does that mean? But rather I'd walk out going, man, this is an amazing life. I wonder what I need to learn. I wonder what's next. I wonder what's next. I was so dependent until I started reading the Bible. And then I got a little smart. And then I began to argue with God. And then I began to disrupt my own life. And then I met the guys that came to the door. And then they disrupted me. And then I got in trouble at work and they disrupted me. Then I had, before you know it, this simple abiding relationship with Jesus Christ was disrupted by taking my attention away from the mindset of, man, Jesus, you're so good to me. I'll do anything you say. Go anywhere you tell me. I'll live my life any way that you want. My life belongs to you. You see, if you abide in me, he says, and my words, verse 7, abide in you, his teachings, his word, remember the Bible says his words are spirit and they are life. If his words are in me, then you're going to ask whatever you desire and I'm going to give it to you. And how many of us today, as we are learning about the topic of being free from our past, how many of us today would just simply ask the Lord, free me from my past? Well, the key answer to that is you're abiding in Christ and his words are abiding in you. How often? Moment by moment. You see, when I was born again, you were born again, and you began your abiding life, it's not a one-time act. Well, Ed, well, I started abiding in Christ 20 years ago. Yeah, but if you add up the moment by moment, this is an abiding life, not an abiding act. It's an abiding life, not an abiding work. It's an abiding life, not a life filled with performance, so that when you perform, you're doing well, and when you don't perform, it's a life. Fruit comes in our lives by, not by work, but by relationship. He desires to work that through us. And the promise and prayer is that communion with Jesus, he will give you the desires of your heart. Your prayers will be answered. This isn't the way it's been twisted today, where you have some teaching that says, well, you know, you can name something from God and then just claim it. And you can just claim your riches and you can just claim your healing. And you can, that they don't understand what Jesus is teaching here. What Jesus is teaching here is very simple. As you moment by moment abide in Christ, his desires are your desires. And that's what your prayers sound like. <laughs> your prayers are in tune with him for the purpose of glorifying the Father. Glorifying the Father. So that the li our life will reflect more of Jesus that we always do that which pleases the Father. 
It's not a promise to demand God to bless us for ourselves. It's a fruit of abiding where you see your prayers answered. Where when I prayed with that brother about his rent, I wasn't sure what God was going to do, but I'll tell you what. The desire of my heart in that moment was to pray that this brother could pay his rent. And just say, man, you, you've got a problem where we're going to take it to the Lord. You've got a problem and we're going to run to the one who can solve it. The problem with the Pharisees, and we'll end with this, the problem with this religious spirit among us, the problem with our high-mindedness, and in the church today, it's such, a, such an air of criticism, such an air of picking out every little point and saying, you're doing it wrong, you're doing it wrong, while at the same time, they're doing it wrong because of the attitude of their heart and the criticisms that come from their mouths. In this atmosphere of a world that is very divided, culturally, religiously, in, in this world that, I mean, I don't know if you've noticed, but we have a world, we live in a culture right now that people don't know how to uh, disagree with one another without trying to destroy the other person. It's okay to have disagreements, even in the body of Christ. Like-mindedness in the body of Christ doesn't mean we agree about every single thing the same way exactly. That's called conformity. And the Bible says that we're only to be conformed into the image of Christ, not to one another. We don't want to become like one another. We want to come, become like Jesus. But like-mindedness means that we generally agree with one another. And we learn how to disagree in love. The Bible doesn't say that the world will know that we're his disciples by our criticisms and our hyper-judgmentalisms and our destroying. As a matter of fact, the Bible in Galatians warns us, church. It warns us of not biting and devouring one another. Can you imagine? It's happening right before our eyes. But rather to abide in him. See, the Pharisees, listen to the description of the Pharisees. It's, the Nelson's Bible Dictionary says this, and I'll quote it. One distinctive feature of the Pharisees was their strong commitment to observing the law of God as it was interpreted and applied by the scribes. Although the priests had been responsible for teaching and interpreting the law in the Old Testament times, Many people had lost all respect for the priests because of the corruption in the Jerusalem priesthood. They looked to the scribes instead to interpret the law for them. Some scribes were priests. Many were not. Still, they lived a pious, disciplined life, and they had been trained to become experts in the law. And it was natural then for people to follow their leading rather than that of the priests. They were dedicated men of the word. Dedicated men of the word. But the problem was, is that the word, they missed the intent of the Bible. And instead of hitting the heart, it went right to their head. And they became theologically right. But in love and practice, very wrong. Even to the description in Matthew's gospel of how Jesus was condemning them. I mean, he, he didn't tell uh, those that were caught up in sin, woe to you. He told the Pharisees, woe to you. And they had, they had reduced tithing down to something that was very precise. And they would tithe all of their little mint. You know, the, if you had a little garden with all these little mint bushes, and they would make sure that if they had a little growth, they would tithe all the mint. But when their parents needed help, they would take money from their parents. I mean, they were tithers of their mint. And while their parents needed help, they would take that for themselves financially. They were completely backwards. How did they miss this? See, they knew the word, but it wasn't abiding in them. Now, of course, they were separate from Jesus Christ, but if they handled the word properly, it would have brought them to Jesus Christ. That's the whole purpose of the law, to point out your needs so that you would embrace Messiah. So they could quote to you, they could speak to you, they could speak with absolute authority, but the word wasn't abiding in them. It wasn't in their heart. Remember in Psalm 119, verse, one, verse 11, they would be familiar with this when David wrote, Your word I have hidden in my heart that I might not sin against you. It's one of the advantages of memorizing Scripture, which has been a lost art form among believers today. Putting God's word in our hearts, memorizing it so the Spirit of God can bring it back at the appropriate time and prevent us from sinning. 
In Ephesians chapter 3, verse 16, it says that God would grant you according to the riches of his glory to be strengthened with might through his spirit in the inner man so that Christ may dwell in your hearts through faith, rooted and grounded in love. The difference that 18 inches can make from their head to your heart in your prayer life, in your evangelizing, in your marriage, in your parenting, in your singleness, in your abiding life. It's just 18 inches. The, the difference between knowing something and knowing it by experience. The differences between argumentation and heartbreak. You know, you, you tend to be an arguer, but your heart's never touched by the needs around you. And so the needs around you are never touched by your heart which is the church of Jesus Christ has been put on the earth to represent him. And his heart was always broken by the sin that he saw. It's the difference between contentions and compassion. A compassionate heart. Desiring to help. The difference between talking about something and doing it. You know, what's the difference between the heart and the head? Well, the heart doesn't let go of things so easily. It's the seat, the very sum of who we are. Both the Hebrews and the Greeks believe this. They, it's the sum of your ado- love and adoration. It's the, it's the sum of, you, you know, when you speak about your heart, it speaks, not, it speaks of your to- totality of your person. But see, love and adoration can be in your heart, but so can bitterness and contempt. And it sticks there. That's why the Bible warns us against letting a root of bitterness pop up in our lives. But our minds, our minds are not so permanent. While our hearts tend to hold on to things, you and I, I mean, if we had a meter in our brain, we'd probably change our mind a thousand times a day. On a dime, we just change, we change lanes, Uh, we go in, we change our drinks at the coffee shop. I mean, we change, we just, no, I want that, no, I want that, no, I want this, I want this. And our minds are constantly changing. You see, if the word of God isn't abiding in us, then we will quickly change our mind away from the truth. And when we quickly change our mind away from the truth, not only are we no longer abiding in Christ and he no longer abiding in us, but if you pay attention... I almost always change my mind to benefit myself, not glorify the Father. The freedom from our past is an abiding life. It's a life where Jesus said, if anyone wants to follow me, let him deny himself, take up his cross and follow me. These promises and principles of abiding, this life of faith and dependence, bring great love into your life and peace a peace that passes all understanding, where the Bible says, be anxious for nothing, but in all things by prayer and supplication, with thanksgiving, make your request be made known to God. And the peace of God that surpasses all understanding will guard your hearts and your minds (laughs) in Christ Jesus. The abiding life is where it's at. Even as you're gonna go home today, you're gonna go home. But even in the context of being here in the sanctuary, you've been abiding under this Bible study. You've been staying put and receiving it as unto the Lord. The word that God has for you. Freedom from our past is found moment by moment abiding in Christ. Because you know as well as I do, we cannot unsend that email. And we can't undo that act. And we can't undo the past any more than we can unscramble an egg. But we can live the life that God has given to us this moment, abiding in him, trusting in him, staying put, casting our cares upon him because he cares for you. Looking for the passages in the Bible that speak life to you that directly relate to the sin issue in your life, to the issue that troubles you, to the issue that concerns you. You know, in the little packet that we give for new believers, there's a couple lists of scriptures there. You might want to check the website and print it out. 
It's a simple list of scriptures that relate to, I don't know, 30 or 40 things in life. Worry, anxiety, fear. The Bible has a lot to say about these things. And so what do we do? We confess God's word. We remain. We trust. We enjoy. Remember, belief is not so much an action as it is rest. And I believe you, Lord. You promise to take care of me. You promised to cover. You promised to defend me. You promised to, to change things. You promised. And so I trust you, and I'm staying put. The past can't get me because I'm in Christ. It can't overtake me because I'm abiding. It can't toss me to and fro because I'm in Christ. And I say moment by moment, I invite you to join me and take as many people as possible to live that abiding life where fruit comes from. And so, Father, we ask that in light of the, our need to be free from our past, sometimes even abiding seems like a work. And we think we just got to do it and we got to work hard and it's all in our minds and it's all what we change. And, and in reality, it's a decision, an empowered decision of your presence in us. And I just pray for the things that are in this room, the things that, the, the minds, that, you know, the, the situations that, that control us, our fears and anxieties, that you would enable us now by your Holy Spirit to cast our cares upon you because you care for us. And I'm grateful, God, that even when I'm faithless, you remain faithful. And I just pray, God, for the unforgiveness that's in this room, that you would just enable and strengthen the freedom that comes from forgiveness. And I, I, I just think specifically, um, someone's listening to me right now that needs to verbally forgive themselves by accepting the forgiveness that you have for them, that no longer do they need to beat themselves up over their failures, but just cast them before you. So I just pray you would enable that man, you would enable that woman. I think it's more than just one. To walk in forgiveness, moment by moment. To remember all that you've done for us. To receive the beauty of righteousness that comes by an abiding presence. You in us and I in you. Your word in us. And I just pray release, Lord, among us tonight that you would release many from the shackles of condemnation. Especially those that are listening to this, you know, on the podcast or on the app, you know, they're seeking out help. Pray for the sister today that I talked to on the radio that committed adultery. And it's just wrecked her home, but they're still together. So I pray for her. I pray you'd strengthen her and her husband. And you get her the kind of help that she needs to give her the wisdom that's needed for them to walk forward and save this 20-year marriage. I know it was a great um, humbling, maybe even humiliating um, thing to do to call a radio station and share such pain. But I know that we overcome these things by the blood of the Lamb and by the word of our testimony. And I can't help but think of the countless people that have survived such sin, Lord. Even as, even as it's painful, the abiding presence of your Spirit brings healing and a calming and a soothingness and true, real forgiveness. Let true, real forgiveness reign in our church, Lord. Let us not be known be, for being critical, critical of our government, critical of people, critical of churches, just, just bite, bite, you know, backbiting. And let us be known. You said that we are to be known for our love, so make us more loving, God. Make us more filled with your love. Let us be accused of hanging out with sinners. Let us be accused of helping too much, serving too much, giving too much to a desperate world. Let us be accused of going to Samaria and talking to a woman in great need. Let us be accused of hanging out with publicans and sinners and yet never touching their sin. Let us be accused of being caring and loving and let, us, let the critics be silenced by your love manifested through us. Forgive us, Lord, for our critical spirits and our defensiveness. Forgive us, Lord, for our, how we are easy to demean and 
put down. Let it not be named among us, Lord. But let us walk in your love and mercy and grace. Let us be abiding, Lord, that you might live your life through us. And we'd be excited like when we were first born again. It wasn't about what we knew. It was about who we knew. And so let us come back to simplicity that we might reach this city with your love. In Jesus' name, amen. We pray that you've been encouraged by this Bible study delivered live from the sanctuary of Calvary Aurora. For prayer or a copy of this study, call us at 877-30-GRACE. That's 877-304-7223. Or visit us online at calvaryaurora.org. Be blessed as you worship Jesus this week.